Welcome to the Exploring Careers in Data Analytics series. My name is Steven Shi, class of 2023, and I would like to introduce this episode's guest speaker. I'm joined today by Wendy Young, class of 2015, machine learning engineer at Block. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Wendy. I'm excited to join you guys too. Hi, Steven. Uh, hi, yeah. So, uh, uh, Wendy, this Siri explores a number of different professional fields uh, involving data analytics. Uh, uh, from my understanding, Block provides financial services and creates digital payment solutions um, to small or large businesses. Uh, I guess in your own words, could you tell us a bit more about the company and your role? Yeah, so Block is a fintech company that uh, the, whose company mission is to enable economic empowerment across the world. It's actually formerly known as Square. And then last December, the CEO Jack Dorsey changed the name to Block to reflect uh, the company's focus in uh, combining different, across different business units, they might start adopting uh, using blockchains as a solution. That's why they renamed the company from Square to Block. And then some sample uh, products uh, across the offerings are those little square that you might have seen being used at, for different small merchants. And then also there's a cash app um, that is, functions like Venmo and you can send money to each other. And also you can buy Bitcoins out of that app. And like some sample use cases, how does that uh, enable economic empowerment is that, for example, if you are from a developing country, and then you want to, uh, let's say you work in another country, I want to send money back to your own country, you can use the cash app for sending the remittance. Yeah. So as for my role, I'm a machine learning engineer on the e-commerce team. So in terms of modeling, I develop proof of concept models, evaluate how good they are, and then I, I put them into production. We also call that uh, as in deployment. And this whole process, I participate in every single steps, making sure that the model uh, doing well and is performing what it's supposed to do. So I monitor them end to end. And um, from in, in particular, so what I'm doing is that um, I develop these models and put them into deployment. And these models are part of a core feature of a product, which is in form of an app. So like on the e-commerce team, we have an app that is called Photo Studio. And what it does is that it enables users to design attractive product images uh, that they can use to list um, their uh, offerings online. And some of the sample features of that app is to remove the background. Uh, like if you take a picture, there is like the foreground, which is your main object, and there's the background. So the app, uh, currently one of the features is to remove the background. And then you can, after that, you can do a lot of image enhancement and all that. So the uh, model removal is uh, powered by a machine learning model. So I help to improve the model and then making sure that it's working for, by function, functioning in, on the app. So, yeah, and then I also work on another product that we have is called um, Restaurant Menu Importer. So what it does is that you can scan like a PDF of uh, restaurant menus, and then we have machine learning models that can uh, scan the PDF and then looking for uh, like dishes name and their price and then convert it into word format such that uh, it creates the whole menu uh, just by scanning and instead of like typing every single dish out and then takes maybe forever to build the menu. Yeah, so I code primarily using Python because most of the machine learning libraries are in Python. And then some of the uh, modeling uh, packages or what I use day to day are NumPy, Pandas. And for modeling, like for basic models, I would use scikit-learn. And then for NLP, I use SpaceC and NLTK. And for uh, deep learning models, I relied heavily on PyTorch and TorchVision. 
And then for monitoring, like running experiment, I want to monitor how good the models are. I use uh, weights and biases. My typical work that goes for like 80% of my time coding or figuring like issues and like working on like my assigned tasks and then 10% collaborating with others and meetings and then 10% time I just spend on uh, drawing designs and documenting my process. So um, in terms of how my team is structured is that uh, it is a team comprised of different roles and that some roles include software engineer, one of them is a product manager, and then one of them is like a designer. And then I'm the, mach I'm the machine learning engineer that provides the ML expertise into, onto the team. And what I do, how I interact with like the business stakeholders is that, um, for example, currently my business stakeholders say, oh, we need improvement of this model based on certain images such as, um, such as food and beverages that they say that when you crop out the background for food and beverages, they always, uh, they seem to leave out the plate. So like they give me the requirement and then I work on it. And then every single day, we'll, every single week, we will have sync up like meeting over Google Meets. And then uh, to, so I walk through what are my process, what are my struggles and some findings to manage expectations. And then after that, um, also, if during the week, if I have any ideas or if I have any questions, then we interact on Slack to solve uh, some of the issues as well. So um, I don't have to do everyday meetings, but then I make sure I'm in like the the business ho the business stakeholder have a good idea what I'm working on and make sure we are uh, understanding we are on the same page. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, so uh, just to clarify, uh, are you currently working remotely or on site in the on, on the company? Yeah, I'm working remotely because uh, Block has made uh, working remote uh, permanently for all the employees. So even well, if we yeah. want, we can work in the office as well. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because you know how learning is different uh, online and offline. So I guess working remotely has its own um, interesting parts and challenges too. Yeah, so I definitely see that um, work like onboarding remotely and also just working remotely is very different than like meeting people in person. And you, if you have questions, you can like, like walk over to like the other person's cube to ask questions right away, right? But then th at the same time, like, I feel like at Blog, there is a very good um, remote culture and that um, they also uh, emphasize uh, asynchronous collaboration, which mm -hmm. means that um, f when you ask someone a question, you don't expect the other person to get back to you right away. And then, um, but then you will try to give very thoughtful response such that um, you don't have to do this bouncing around conversation, like one sentence each, that kind of conversation, but instead you have very thoughtful communication with a long messages or that yeah. you leave enough documentation that if someone needs to start working on something, they have enough information to begin working on it without like paying every single person like on the team. So I think with that kind of collab with that kind of working environment, it was very easy for me to like get started on projects and without much roadblocks because I'm waiting for someone else's response. And then on the yeah. other hand, I think um really great thing about blog is also that for example, I have some environment set up issues specifically to Python. And then mm -hmm. I can find a Slack channel and ask questions and people will mm -hmm. respond uh, for fairly quickly, even though they are not on my team. So I've felt pretty supported, even though I'm not working in the office, because I think the wider community has fostered a pretty good uh, work remote and collaborative culture, even though you're not in the person, in meeting in person. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. So I guess supportive environment is just the key to uh, remote working. Um, and then just, I guess, coming back to your uh, working experience, can you just uh, talk a bit more about except 
the supportiveness uh, and other things that you like about your job? Um, I think I enjoy being able to solve complex problems using an ele elegant solution using machine learning. And uh, that gives me a like, huge sense of satisfaction. And I think that has to do with because I have a very engineering mindset that I really uh -huh. like building things and like solve a problem and build something. So uh, I think it's just like being able to uh, work on something that I like or work on a problem that interests me and be able to solve it. I really enjoy that part of my job. Yeah, right. Uh, and then I was also wondering if you could just talk more specifically about uh, any of the projects that I mean, you, you mentioned that you uh, use uh, photo recognition with computer vision uh, or like deep learning, but uh, could you just share like one project that is like, I guess, most memorable and then that you learn a lot from? Yeah, so I can talk a little bit about a project that I did at my previous company. And um, so the context is that a business holder came to the team with a lot of business news as emails in the inbox they yeah they have 3000 emails every day yeah. and then the business holder would like to figure out if like among all these news receiving any every day are there some relevant news for her team about a group of company and for a specific theme so um for them to manually click through all the news is very time consuming and it's not very effective Right. So they went, so they came to us. So what I did was that I applies the natural language processing techniques such as entity recognition and also um, TFIDF. And um, then I built a classific classification model on top of the DFIDF IDF factors to filter through the news and create a daily digest emails for all the relevant news. So at the end, in at the end, so what happens is that they can just every single day, they will receive one email that uh, summarizes um, all the relevant news and also highlighting to them which company is being talked about in the news article. So it helped them to save time and also find um, relevant news right away. So that is like the, that is the, what was the project is about and then how we solved it. And then I guess I would caution just one thing is that um, when people think about uh, solving uh, problems using machine learning, I would actually encourage people to see if they can solve it with baseline simple machine learning models, such as decision trees or um, such as like a simple classification model using a support vector machine before they looking for a solution in deep learning space, just because you need so much more data to build a deep learning model. And not so not every use case um, can be solved using deep learning. So just uh, curious more about uh, data scientists or like machine learning engineer in general. Can you uh, just share a bit more about, I guess, the career path of a typical machine learning engineer? How is the, um, how you expected, uh, what is the entry level role and then what will be your uh, future progression, I guess? So I think a typical machine learning engineer would have a good understanding of a lot of CS concepts and also have good knowledge of um, machine learning theories and good understanding of math, such that uh, when there is a model that being uh, sent to the machine learning engineer, they can, uh, they can debug the prototypes and also they understand enough about uh, com computer science such that they can modify the code and make it very scalable for uh, the, at the inferencing part where you deploy the model into production. And then if there are like billions and trillions of queries every day, the model can still function properly and then efficiently. So I think in terms of a typical progression, you will be, you will just, uh, after you have a uh, master's degree or undergrad degree, you just become a machine learning engineer and progress from there. But then it's, since this is a very new field, there's actually no typical progression. Right. I would say, for example, for me, I started out working on data analysis project and then I did a master's and became a data scientist. And then 
I gained a lot of engineering experiences at that job as, as a data scientist. And then you just kind of come back, combine different heads and then become a machine learning engineer. So I wouldn't say like, don't feel like you cannot, you cannot become an engineer, machine learning engineer because you lack certain skills. I would say just try to start somewhere and then um, make your way through by uh, learning, picking up all the other skills. So I'm also curious about uh, your own experiences uh, from campus to career. Uh, so admit uh, you were a, a history major and minor in math. Uh, and then I guess, could you just share more about uh, the rest of your journey from uh, Middlebury to Bach? Yeah, so um, my passion is in history, actually. I think it will always be so if I'm like retired in the future, I do want to go back to like reading and writing history. And yeah. then um, when I was graduating, I realized I want to look for something or like a career where I can do both um, quantitative and qualitative analysis. Right. And then, so, so, so I was thinking that, oh, maybe I can try out for investment. It sounds like like a good need for num being good at numbers, but then also be able to an analyze different synthesis, different sources of information yeah. and come up with some ideas and write it out. So I tried out for investment. And then when I, at this first job at investment, I stumbled upon natural language processing and I was working with data scientists uh, on the project and I was fascinated by it, like the and the whole idea of NLP because for, for me, sometimes I would picture linguistics patterns in my head and I was thinking how, how you can like, instead of solving it through you highlight something how, by hand, how, like, how can you scale it up or how can you go through all the sources Quickly. Yeah. And I, I realized that like, there are already like computer uh, algorithms that can find linguistics patterns like that. And I was so fascinated by it. And then at that point, I felt like I found something I'm really passionate about it. And then I want to keep learning. So that's yeah. why I decided to go back to grad school at Georgia Tech and did a master's at uh, analytics and then become a data scientist and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that sounds great. Uh, so I mean, you mentioned that uh, you actually worked for uh, about three years and then went back to school. So um, can you just uh, talk about the importance of uh, an advanced degrees uh, like you had in Georgia Tech and then is an, an advanced degrees important for you? And what are some of the things that I guess uh, you could do after you earn this degree? Yeah, so I think for um, software engineer, it typically do not require an advanced degree, but I guess if you want to go into a very particular branch of CS, maybe an advanced degree would be helpful. And in this scenario, it would be uh, data science. If you want to mm -hmm. go deeper into data science, typically most people have a master's degree or a PhD. And I think that is because you really like the job really requires a lot of different skill sets for example good level of statistics and yeah. then good level of um uh, machine learning theories and then also good cs theories and then also a bunch of practical skills like like databases and all that and data mm -hmm. visualization skills and good communication skills and all that combining so it requires a lot of different skill sets and typically people um, would have an advanced degree of work a few years in quantitative fields before switching yeah. over to data science, then that is how people like get just picked up these skill sets on the way such that they can be a good data scientist. Yeah. And then I think for me that um, I did a master's of analytics at Georgia Tech to uh, hone up my uh, machine learning theories. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really beneficial for me. and. Uh, it served me really well at um, at my data science jobs, and I would recommend people uh, like if you want to take a few, a, one or two years to focus on, fo uh, really focus on picking up something and without worrying about yeah. like the day to day job. Then I would think an advanced degree is a good idea. 
And but then it doesn't mean that if you don't have the advanced degree, then you wouldn't be able to switch over to data science. But you probably need to find some other projects or some other that dedicated time to acquire the skills required that you need to be able to be a good data scientist. Yeah, yeah, that that that, that sounds good. Yeah, thank you, Winnie. So, uh, I guess, uh, could you also share a bit more about how uh your Middlebury experience uh, fits into all of these uh, career decisions, uh, major decisions, or your uh, day to day work? And is there any less important lessons that you draw from your Middlebury experiences and then uh, you apply them, I guess, in your own work? Yeah. Actually, I really learned a lot as a history major. And, and then, as I was a research assistant from my advisor, Professor Phoebe Amanius, I learned so much in terms of what is a good researcher and how to do um, deep analytical work. For example, uh -huh. I go through the whole process of collecting data sources, working with ambiguities in the data, and then learning how to construct arguments and communicate findings in a written form to an audience that these skills are all invaluable skills for a good data scientist. Because even though I'm collect, like even though, for example, when I'm working on my current project right now, I still need to collect data and then these data are not perfect. And then I need to analyze how good my models are and then be able to communicate these findings to an audience. So having this um, logical way of thinking and then also being able to have the ability to communicate and articulate well to an audience is like very important transferable skills that yeah. I learned as a history major. Yeah. And then in terms of other um, important lessons that I learned at MIT, it also includes, um, I, I learned to be open-minded and flexible in exploring my career path. So while I was at Middlebury, I tried out for different things. I had a journalism internship, I worked at startups, and then I tried academic research and so on. And it was it was a lot of exploring and trials things that I've never tried before, and then yeah. it's just kind of similar to how um, when you would when you would uh, take a geography class, even though you're not a geography major. So I did a lot of different things. I learned how to ramp up things quickly and learn quickly. And I think when you're at a career that you will be able to, you will be open minded to be able to try out different new uh, opportunities and also find ways to let yourself to become really good at a short period of time. So this kind of, this lesson really helped me a lot in my career. Given your experiences and knowledge right now, um, what are some of the uh, best um, advice that you can give to current Middlebury students uh, seeking a job uh, or like uh, a career in the analytics field? Yeah, so I think I have networked with several Middlebury students before when they're interested in entering the uh, data science or data analytics field. And my question to them or my advice to them would always be, have you done any projects and um, like, have you done any internships? Because I think that uh, picking up a data set and then do deep analytic work on it and also uh, being able to articulate the results those experiences count a lot if you want to enter into the data analytics field so mm -hmm. like what classes you take or oh that kind of uh, credentials would help but then what i would see actually would be i look at someone's resume and then if they mention the top like mention a project that they have done or they mention an internship that they have done, then I would go deeper into their experiences and talk about like, how they handle the, how to handle the data set, what kind of data processing that they have done, what are some models they have trained, why did they pick these models, and then what was the output from it. So like by doing projects like that, then you will be able to answer this really well and help me to understand how thoughtful you are in terms of um, handling the data and what kind of insights you have in terms of looking through the data. So I would say that my advice really is to just do different projects 
um, whether it is internship or just picking a data set that you're really passionate about, picking a topic you're really passionate about and find data and do able to address certain questions. That would be my advice for people who are interested in joining the analytics field. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, sounds, that sounds really great. Um, again, and then I guess just uh, one last question might be uh, uh, I, that we all know that uh, machine, machine learning engineering is very uh, competitive field uh, to enter. And then, so could you talk a bit more about your uh, uh, interviewing process? Is there any uh, good advice um, specifically on that and like preparing for both like interviews and like, yeah. Yeah, so typically there are multiple rounds in like uh, machine learning or data science interviews. And the first round would be like a resume screen. So people would ask you about your projects, what have you done and so on. And then if you perform fairly well, then it would be a, either a take home assignment where uh, you, you would do, for example, for me at one of the job interviews I had, I had to do a four hours take home exam. They give me the data set and I have to within four hours implement a model from scratch, including feature engineering and the inferencing job. And I have to document the process and show them like um, how, how I dis make decisions along the way and document them really well. And then yeah. um, be able to, uh, inference on new data sets at the end. So to do the predictions. So that would be the uh, take home exam, or it might be like a coding round where they give you a live problem. And then there's one hour you work through pair coding with an interviewer. So I've yeah. done both and it's very typical. And then after that, if you pass that tech screening round, then it will be the final round where um, there will be a combination of technical and interpersonal questions to see how well you, how good you are in terms of a cultural fit to the company and also an assessment of your technical skills in greater details. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, thank you once again for uh, your engagement with us in helping students uh, preparing their first career destinations. No problem. Yeah, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and um, I will follow up with you if you reach out. Yeah, uh, yeah. so uh, this concludes this episode within the series Exploring Careers in Data Analytics. Uh, in closing, I want to encourage viewers to tune in and get career perspectives and advice from a number of professionals in broad variety of organizations in our other episode in this series. I also want to encourage you to tune in to the other mid venture series, which can be accessed through the event and program tab on the CCI website. Uh, thanks again for watching. Thank you.